So thank you very much for that, for that introduction, Juliet. Uh, I would also like to thank on, on this occasion the directors of CAPAS, Thomas and Robert, for giving me the chance to be here as a fellow in a somewhat different environment from my usual academic habitat, both in, in disciplinary terms and certainly today in climatic terms. I do most, most of my teaching during the winter months in, in the north of England. Sometimes we struggle to see the sun from one day to the next. So a, a lecture in 30 degree heat, although it's a bit cooler in here than that, is, is somewhat apocalyptic for me. So I'd also like to thank my fellow CAPAS fellows and, and CAPAS staff members for their hospitality and stimulating discussions over the, pa the past few months. So as, as Juliet said, the overarching theme of this semester's lecture series is apocalyptic space and time. And today I shall be ranging quite extensively over, over both of these dimensions, looking back to our ancient cosmic origins a few billion years ago, and then in the other direction to our long-term future once the sun has reached the end, end of its lifetime and going from our locality within the solar system and out into the Milky Way galaxy beyond. So the title of my lecture is the title of my overarching CAPAS project for which I'm here for these four months. And in today's talk, I'm gonna give you a, a very broad overview of the many different but intimately related topics I've been looking into. These are topics that are either, that are apocalyptic, either in the modern sense, meaning either the, the partial or complete destruction of the world as we know it, or harking back to the traditional Greek roots of the word apocalypse, meaning the revelation of that which was hidden. And that, and that latter description certainly applies to the potential discovery of life beyond Earth as and when we should find it. So here's, here's the outline of, of my talk today. So I'm gonna begin with a brief overview of the, the overall overarching area of space risks to set the scene and, and the wider context. And then, and, and also describe how I, I came to work, work in this particular area. I'm then gonna move on to what I call moderate cosmic hazards, including both relatively modest asteroid impacts that may have the potential to wipe out a, a large metropolitan area, and, and solar storms. So both of these hazards may occur roughly on a kind of centennial time scale, and they could have direct and indirect impacts comparable with what we've lived through, all lived through with the COVID, COVID pandemic. So having shown that Earth is exposed to, to cosmic threats from outside, it's then no extrapolation to, to move beyond that and say that there are actually events occurring out there, both within our solar system and out in the Milky Way galaxy that could, could well be existential hazards for life on Earth. We'll see, fortunately, that these are very, very rare events. We shouldn't be overly concerned, although I'll caution, caveat that with a few, few interesting observations. But then we'll then pivot out and think about how these existential hazards may affect life elsewhere in the galaxy. We'll show that they are an important determinant in, 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 well, in determining when and where life may have been able to arise in, in the long history of, of the Milky Way galaxy. From that point, we'll pivot on to think about what's, been going, what's going on now in terms of the, the efforts to find life beyond Earth, should it exist. We'll consider the various approaches and channels, and we're going to frame this as, as an apocalyptic event and look more broadly at the kind of the, the, the philosophy, the, the kind of the way in which our, our worldview of, of the cosmos may change once we kind of incorporate life, life within that. Finally, in the last part of the talk, I'll look out and consider our own prospects, our own post-apocalyptic future in space. So, as Juliet said, for the first part of my career, I was an extragalactic astronomer. I was looking at some of the faintest and oldest light in the universe at distant galaxies and black holes. And such objects, by virtue of their distance and the faintness of the light pose, obviously no threat to us in the here and, and the now at all. But about 10 years ago, I took up a, a teaching focus role and decided I wanted to be doing something that had a more immediate rele relevance to, to life in, on Earth in the here and now. So I moved 
into, to work on, on space risks. And these are broadly defined as encompassing threats to Earth-based activities from space events, be they kind of natural cosmic events or things arising from our, our activities in space, and the risks in, inherent in our space activities themselves. And these encompass all of the topics shown here, so natural cosmic hazards, space de debris, space sustainability, asteroid mining, terrorist and military activity in space. So it's quite a broad, a, a broad, a broad area. And ultimately, I published as co-editor this book alongside the, one of the UK's leading space law and policy experts, Chris Newman. So we considered well, the impacts of, of these events on the natural environment, technological infrastructure, and more broadly on the social order, the rule of law, international relations, and looked at the solutions. So we had obviously specialist contributors in each of these areas. My particular focus and the focus of my talk today is on the natural cosmic hazards, the asteroids, the comets, space weather, and the galactic hazards arising from further afield. So uh, the wake up call for me to get in, involved in this and a wake up call for the community more generally was this event, the Chelyabinsk meteor event that occurred just over 10 years ago. So what happened was uh, a hitherto for unknown object about 19 meters in diameter entered the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere and exploded in proximity to the, the Russian town of, of Chelyabinsk. And this produced a, 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 well, it's a huge explosion. It was about 30 kilometers in altitude. The ensuing, there was a bright flash of light captured by many, many dash cams in the early morning rush hour. The ensuing blast wave damaged more than 7,000 7, buildings and injured 1,500 people. So mainly from the effects of flying glass. So what happened was people saw the bright light, rushed to the window, and then a few seconds or minutes later, due to the slower, uh, sound travel time, the windows exploded and they were shattered with, with glass. So this was one of, of the biggest impacts, cosmic Im impacts since the somewhat legendary Tunguska event in the early part of, of the 20th century. So the explosive energy released from Chelyabinsk was about 500 kilotons of TNT equivalent. So for comparison, the Hiroshima nuclear bomb was about 15 kilotons. And one may speculate on, on how the response may have been different had this occurred in, in the current geopolitical climate. So, as I said, this was a stimulus for me to get interested in the subject. It was also a stimulus to kind of increase planetary defense efforts, both by kind of national governments, space agencies, and the UN, and also give rise to, to public awareness events, for example, the Asteroid Day. So the Tunguska event that I, that I just mentioned was a huge explosion that occurred on the 30th of June, 1908, in a very remote part of Siberia. And it was so remote in the boreal, uh, boreal forests that the first follow-up expeditions well, didn't occur for another, another 20 years or so. So the explosion was felt, even with the primitive technology at the time, pretty much worldwide in terms of the air blasts, the seismic activity, and the kind of disruption to the atmosphere in terms of higher dust levels for, for weeks and months thereafter. So what the first explorers found when they managed to get to the kind of the ground zero of this event, about 20 years later, was well, complete devastation, a lot of trees completely flattened. So at the, the ground zero point, the trees were still standing vertically, but stripped of all their branches. And then further afield out to about 70 kilometers, the trees were, were completely flattened, kind of in, in a direction pointing away from the epicenter of the blast. So the overall zone of destruction was 2,000 square kilometers. So that is comparable to a large metropolitan area, say the area within the kind of orbital motorway of, of London, for example. And the, the ultimate origins, origins of this event are still somewhat shrouded in mystery. The best theory we have is that it resulted from the atmospheric entry and explosion of roughly a 60 meter diameter cometary fragment. But 
people have struggled to find kind of conclusive evidence for the remnants of, the, those, of that object. There's no obvious crater. And people have speculated that perhaps the object just skimmed off the atmosphere and exited again. There have been other theories. For example, it could have been some explosive gas leak. It's kind of gas from the Earth that, that came out and then exploded at altitude. There were even speculations during the Soviet era that it was uh, a disaster from a nuclear disaster from an alien spaceship. But then let's look more broadly now at the kind of uh, and systematically at, at the impact, the impact threat. So roughly 100 tons of cosmic dust enters our atmosphere every single day, very small particles, and similar to the grains of sand or, that we may see in meteor showers. But there's then a continuum of sizes of, of particles and rocks and boulders above that, and shown by this graph here. So I've highlighted what well, we show on the lower axis, the diameter of the objects in kilometers. On the y-axis, it's a measure of the frequency. And as with most things, the, the bigger, more extreme objects are somewhat less, less common. I've highlighted both the Chelyabinsk and Tunguska impactors, uh, events on there. I've also highlighted this, the so-called Steinheim and, and Ries uh, craters, roughly on the border between Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg. This was due to, to uh, it could have been a binary asteroid, although opinion is a bit divided on that, about 15 years ago. And the larger of the two events, the, 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 the Reese impactor, so that was believed to be a one kilometer object that gave rise to this, the, the present day 20 kilometer wide crater. And of course, we have the, at the most extreme end here, we have the, the well known Chicxulub crater that the, the event that wiped out the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, a 10 kilometer diameter object. So we see these different characteristic scales that are highlighted here. And, and we see estimated population sizes. So we see that the kind of the upper end of the scale, we know most of where most of the objects are. But when we come down to about the, the 100 uh, meter mark, the, the kind of completeness of our knowledge d d drops off dramatically. We only know about a quarter of the 100 meter diameter objects that would have capacity to destroy a large metro area, roughly on a, a frequency of, of about a century. And objects like this, they, they explode, well, they, they have, there's an explosive airburst and a possible, a possible crater. The one kilometer diameter mark which aligns with the, the size of the Reese impactor is quite significant because once you get to that level, the, the wider climatic effects become global. So the, the, kind of the, the, the damage globally from the climate downturn is ultimately, ultimately more severe than the localized impacts in, in the impact region itself. So in terms of surveillance efforts, a lot of the attention is focusing on the region around 100 meters well, to, within a factor of two or three, either way of that. So these objects are, are common enough to, to, to pose a significant threat, and, and they're big enough to, to do significant damage, but they're not so big that we could not potentially avert the consequences of an impact. So let's, let's have a look now at the, the techniques of, of asteroid deflection, look at the, at the physics and at the geopolitics of this. So, Near-Earth objects, roughly, well, which have orbits obviously in the vicinity of the Earth, we can track them decades ahead in many cases. We can see, we can project, we can identify potential impactors quite a number of years in advance. So if we can see that there is an object on a collision course with the Earth, we could arguably attempt to avert that by giving the asteroid a small nudge. So for example, if you nudge if you change the speed of an object by a couple of kilometers per, sorry, a couple of centimeters per second, so remember these objects are going around the sun at many tens of kilometers per second, if you give them a small nudge, a couple of centimeters per second change in velocity, far enough ahead of time, say 10 years ahead of time, that's enough to shift the object relative to the Earth at the impact time by more than an Earth radius, right? So you can avert the collision. So this is this, an example of, of this, a demonstration of this technology was carried out 
just last September by the NASA DART mission, the double asteroid redirection test. And so what they did, they had this, this binary asteroid, so a pair of small asteroids orbiting each other. And because it's a binary, they can easily track the, the relative motions of the two objects. So they slammed this kinetic impactor at six kilometers per second into the smaller of these two components. And as a result, it, it changed its velocity by only a few millimeters per second. But that was enough to change the orbital period of this binary. And in the process of that collision, it excavated about a million tons of rock from the object. And the excavation of that rock actually enhanced the efficiency of, of the momentum transfer. So this was the first demonstration of, of this new technology. So aside from the kind of technological, technical aspects, there are kind of international law and politics features that come into play. For example, the issue of liability in the event of failure under international space law. And what about if you have an issue where we're not able to, to avert an impact entirely, but say we want to move the impact site from, say, a highly densely, a densely populated site on the location of the Earth to a very sparsely populated desert, for example. So there are a lot of geopolitical issues involved with that and, and what happens if it goes wrong. There are also concerns about, say, rogue actors harnessing this technology for malign purposes. So there are many, many more objects that just miss the Earth than, than actually impact. So if this technology falls into the wrong hands, somebody could use it to divert an object that was not due to impact onto a collision course with Earth and create a destructive weapon of incredible potency. Right, so the other moderate cosmic hazard I want to talk about uh, is the solar storms. And these are, these are very different in some ways from, from the asteroid, asteroid impacts. Asteroid impacts, the physics is simple, right? Everybody can understand it. Solar storms, the physics is, is incredibly complex, even, even for astronomers. So the sun is a, a seething ball of magnetized plasma. There's, there's winds, the solar wind flowing off it continuously. But from time to time, you get magnetic instabilities, mainly around sunspots, that lead to the release of what are called coronal mass ejections or, or huge flares of plasma that race through, through, through uh, interplanetary space at high speed. And if they should hit the Earth, they get channeled down the magnetic field lines and manifest as spectacular aurorae, as shown, as shown here. But until we, we developed electrical technology, say in the middle of the 19th century, the hazard they posed was, was non-existent, right? Obviously, to the... To, to people who saw them, they were long regarded as kind of uh, harbingers of doom in the, way that, in the way that comets were. But they had no effect, no deleterious effects until we started to, to, to use electrical technology. And nowadays, given the, the extent of our reliance on electrical technology, both on the ground and satellites in space, the, the effects of a, of a severe solar storm could be absolutely catastrophic and have impacts on satellite navigation, communication systems, transport, even electrical power grids. And the benchmark event for, the, for this type of thing is, is the so-called Carrington event that occurred in 18, 1859. And at, at the time when kind of intercontinental uh, telegraphy was getting started, there were major, major disruptions to that. And the aurora was so severe and so extreme that people could read newspapers well, well, in broad daylight at night. Aurora was seen as far south as the Bahamas. And it's been estimated that under a worst case scenario, a repeat today could cause damage running into the, the trillions of dollars. That's both direct damage to, say, electrical power grids and indirect damage in terms of lost economic output. And so later today, I'll be going to a lecture marking the 125th anniversary of the Land of Sternwarte here on the Königstuhl. And I just note in passing that uh, Richard Carrington, after whom the Carrington event is, is named, was actually an observer at my own university observatory back in the early 1850s. So there's an interesting local connection there for aficionados of astronomical history. Anyway, such is the concern 
in kind of policy circles about the impacts of this, that it's risen up the policy agenda, a policy agenda, and severe space weather now features, for example, in the UK government's national risk register of civil emergencies, an extract from which is, is shown here, the 2015 version. And more generally, these Tunguska-style sized impacts, carrington events, solar storms, are what you would call kind of once per century hazards. So they're, they're frequent enough that we should, in a societal way, be concerned about them, but they're not frequent enough that most, organ most organizations and individuals have much first-hand experience of dealing with them. And you will see on here, in the top of the column, pandemic influenza. So like many governments, the UK government had notional plans for dealing with, with, with pandemics. And as they conduct their inquiries into what went, went wrong and, and what went right and not so right in, in the pandemic, there are perhaps potentially lessons that we can learn and apply to, to, these, to these space hazards as well. And, and we've seen as well that initially modest or localized events can have global ramifications in our highly interconnected global economy and, and society. Right, so I'm now going to shift the focus away from our kind of local habitat in the solar system and move out into the wider Milky Way galaxy. So this is a picture of, of the night sky looking towards the galactic center. And we see the, the, the kind of the broad plane of, of the Milky Way galaxy, this large dust lane as we look right, right directly into the, the galactic center through, through the plane. And the, and the bright concentration of the star field towards the galactic center. And for those not, not familiar with, with, with a great deal of astronomy, I'm showing here kind of a plan and edge on view of what we think our own Milky Way galaxy looks like. So obviously, we're, we're inside the Milky Way. We don't, we can't, we don't really, we can't see what it's like in, in, in its totality in the way we can with, with external galaxies. But this is a, kind of a good impression of what we think the Milky Way looks like. So it's a, it's broadly, it's a disk, a disk galaxy, approximately about 100,000 light years in diameter. And as we look edge on, this, this disk here, about, about 2,000 light years thick, and the sun lies about halfway out from the center in this small spur of a spiral arm in the, in the very, very relatively quiet galactic suburbs, suburbs as it were. Most of the star formation in the galaxy takes place in, in this disk, in these blue spiral arms. And the, the, the kind of orange-yellow bulge is the location of most of the, of the older stars. Right at the center, there's a four million mass, solar mass black hole there as well, which we'll touch upon shortly. It's currently inert, not, not doing a great deal, but that, that may change. Right, I'll just... So now I want to look at some potentially existential hazards that could impact life on Earth. And I've catalogued a few here. So they include nearby supernovae, stellar explosions, and gamma ray bursts, a particular type of, of stellar explosion. Possible flare-up of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, known as Sagittarius A star. There are possibilities of de destabilization of the solar system by a passing star. If a passing star comes too close, although exceptionally rare, it could disturb the orbits of the planets, possibly strip away the planets entirely if it, become, if it comes in very close. There are also possibilities of, of dust clouds coming into the solar system, blocking the sun's light, triggering an ice age. Now, the recurrence times, recurrence timescales for events like this are typically, individually, at least a billion years. So there's no real threat to us in the here and the now, as we would conventionally understand it. But we should beware that our, our knowledge is incomplete. Our models are almost certainly not correct in every detail. And the history of astronomy shows, even in the last, over the last century, that Whenever we look at the universe in a new way, we tend to discover new things. 
and among them could be potentially hazardous phenomena. Unrelated to that, there's something called anthropic bias, right? It's a, it's a very strong selection effect. You could imagine, for example, that 99.9999% of all civilizations on all planets is destroyed at a certain stage of development for reasons we don't understand. But we are, only, we are a sample of one, right? The fact that we are here cannot in and of itself be used to infer anything about, about such, such processes, right? We, 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 we may just be a spectacularly lucky outlier. Our, our knowledge, our astrophysical understanding suggests not, but in kind of strict philosophical terms, we should bear in mind this, this anthropic bias. So looking in a bit of detail at a couple of these, these hazards, so firstly, nearby supernovae, so the, 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 which arise from the explosions, in many cases, of, of very massive, massive stars. They emit a lot of hazardous radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays, and radioactive nuclei. But the atmospheric impact in terms of what would happen here on Earth if a, if a relatively nearby supernova went off, the atmospheric impact will be dominated by the destruction of the ozone layer, right? So 90% of the solar ultraviolet UVB radiation is currently filtered out by the ozone layer. But these high energy particles would potentially lead to this, the destruction of that. So that would be the, the kind of the, the direct kind of causal impact of a nearby supernova. So we think that in order to be lethal in this way, and, and you, you, if the, the UV comes through, you start to destroy the food chain and ultimately all of life. The kind of so-called kill, kill distance of a, a supernova, which would be deadly, was long thought to be about, about 30 light years. More recent studies suggest it could be a bit larger than that, and there's certainly no sharp, sharp cutoff. And the ozone depletion from such an event would last a few hundred years. At the moment, our understanding is that, on average, such nearby supernovae would occur once every billion years. If we're looking a bit further out, they become more frequent. There is evidence that about two or three million years ago, a number of supernovae did explode within a few hundred light years of Earth. Geologists have detected radioactive iron 60 in ocean sediment layers that, that, that show that, which is quite, quite, quite interesting. Fortunately, According to our understanding, there are no known supernova candidates within range, right? So that's what, that's what matters to us. We don't care so much about the long-term statistical risk. It's what is the situation in the here and now. You may be aware that there has been some interest in the star Betelgeuse in the, the top left-hand corner of the constellation of Orion, one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's a, it's a red supergiant. It's nearing the end, end of its lifetime. It's about 500 light years away. And back in early 2020, just around the start of the, the pandemic, it underwent a dramatic dimming. So it became as dim, as dim as we've ever seen it in modern times. Now, this year, it's as bright as we've ever seen it in modern times. And it's pulsating twice as fast as it normally does. So people have speculated that is it about to blow up as a supernova? We, th we think not. We think it has maybe another few thousand or maybe a million years to go. But if it were to explode, it would be a pretty spectacular event. It would shine as bright as the full moon in the sky. You'd see, you'd see it by daylight for a, pretty much a year or so, and then it would just disappear. So Orion would be completely changed forever. Right, so I think on the whole way, we can rest pretty easily from the supernova threat. This is the star Eta Carina, somewhat further away, that went a dramatic, underwent a dramatic brightening in the mid-19th mid century, and has also been touted as another potential uh, supernova candidate. We cannot be too sure of our safety from what are called uh, gamma-ray bursts. So these are a type of supernova from very massive stars, which instead of kind of being a fully isotropic explosion in all directions equally, what happens is virtually all the energy is channeled into a pair of very narrow pencil beams of gamma rays lasting from a few seconds to minutes. 
They were found in the 1970s by spy satellites, which were actually mainly looking downwards for nuclear explosions. And the destructive reach of these can, can be many, many thousands of light years. So one of these going off virtually anywhere in the galaxy could be damaging to life on Earth. And in recent years, I've done modeling of, of the frequency of these, both myself in, in my book I mentioned and with my, my students, and taken into account the, the history of star formation in the Milky Way and the other factors that are needed, we think that currently the rate is very low. We're not going to get hit. We're unlikely statistically to get hit by one of these while the sun remains a kind of a habitable star. But in our cosmic past, when the Earth was forming a few billions of years ago, the rates of these were substantially higher. So statistically speaking, it's quite likely that the Earth was radiated by one or more gamma ray bursts in the early eons of the evolution of life. And there have been numerous mass extinctions at periods of many hundred, several hundreds of years apart, hundreds of millions of years apart. And it's, it's debatable whether any of these could have been actually caused by, by a gamma ray burst. Right, finally, on the kind of menu of, of galactic apocalypses, I want to mention briefly, again, the, the supermassive black hole at the center. So on the left here, we see some images of, of stars in the very center of the Milky Way galaxy. And over about 30 years, astronomers have been monitoring the motions of these stars. And from their orbits, they can infer that there is a kind of an unseen, hidden mass in the center of the galaxy, which we now strongly think is a four million solar mass black hole. And last year, it was imaged by radio telescopes, and they've actually seen what's called the event horizon of the black hole. This, this kind of black cavity in the center is, you are seeing there, the black hole at the center of the galaxy. It's currently not doing much. It maybe flares up from time to time. About 100 years ago or more, it was substantially brighter, we can infer. And a few million years ago, it was a lot brighter. It was almost an active galaxy. But models of galaxy formation show that some galaxies, that galaxies can enter a very catastrophic, non-linear, extremely rapid phase of a black hole growth, supermassive black hole growth. And arguably, our own supermassive black hole has not yet been through that phase. It could be that in a few hundred million years' time, possibly when it merges with the Andromeda galaxy, we could embark on this highly nonlinear, rapid growth that would see its mass grow by a factor of 10 or 100. And that, in turn, would be potentially quite damaging for life on Earth, to say the least. Right, so we've discussed the situation of life on Earth, and we've seen that these existential hazards are nothing really to worry about now. But let's cast the net further afield and look at the potential, the, the potential impact on any life elsewhere. And so it's believed that cosmic hazards have a strong influence on when and where in the life of the galaxy life could evolve. And there's a broad understanding that there's something called the galactic habitable zone. It's, not, it's limits are not particularly well defined, but it's broadly understood that there are some regions of the galaxy that are more suitable to life than others. For example, if you're, if you're too far out in, the, in, the, in a large radius from the center, there's not enough heavy element material to build terrestrial planets. You're at risk of, of gamma ray bursts out there. If you're right in the center, the star field is very dense. You're frequently disturbed by stellar collisions or, or supernovae going off there. But the Milky Way, the, the, the sun, lies about halfway out and in most views is squarely within the, in the central regions of this galactic habitable zone. Now, an interesting discovery that was made about, about 20 years ago by Charles Lineweaver, looking more broadly at the habitable zones in, in the Milky Way, is that the bulk of sun-like stars in this habitable zone are actually several billion years older than the sun, right? So if there's any life on these planets, and we now know from surveys of planets in the last 25 years that most sun-like stars do have 
rocky terrestrial planets in their stellar habitable zones, if there's life on these other planets, around these other stars, they have a several billion year head start of, on us, right? So just think about that, right? In terms of what, how the evolution may have developed and particularly in terms of technology, right? We can't imagine a, a, two, a several billion year head start in technological terms. So this puts a sharper focus on what's called Fermi's paradox. The, you, you may have heard of this. So it goes back to some legendary remarks made by the physicist Enrico Fermi in the early 1950s when there was a lot of hype about UFOs in, in the US. So he casually remarked that, well, where, where is everybody? Why are there no aliens here on Earth? So look, after all, and of course, he didn't know about extrasolar planets or anything about life beyond Earth, but he speculated that if there, is, if there are any other, other civilizations out there, if just one of them has developed the capability for interstellar travel, say, at 10% of the speed of light, which is fairly modest, they could rapidly colonize the galaxy. So within a few million years, such life could spread throughout the galaxy, right? A few million years is a factor of uh, well, 100 or more less than the age of the galaxy. So we would naively expect that the, life would be, that the galaxy would be teeming with life. But there's no conclusive evidence for their signals, alien spacecraft, or their artifacts. So this has become enshrined as, as Fermi, Fermi's paradox. It was long for long not taken particularly seriously. You might hear it mentioned in sci-fi films and so on. But more recently, with the, the rise of astrobiology, detections of exoplanets, it's been taken a lot more seriously. And in its modern, more rigorous form, it provides the kind of unspoken philosophical underpinnings of the search for life elsewhere, as exemplified in these two recent scholarly books published by Oxford and Cambridge University Presses, respectively, The Great Silence by Milan Sokovic and Solving Fermi's Paradox by Duncan Forgan. And most of the solutions to the paradox of where is everybody actually turn out potentially to have major implications both for the understanding of our long-term, our ancient cosmic origins and our very, very long-term fate. There are more radical solutions that could require a complete and utter overhaul of our cosmic worldview. So let's now move to think about what is happening as far as the search for life beyond Earth is concerned. This is one of the most rapidly developing areas of, of astronomy. So about 25, 30 years ago, we started to detect planets, mainly by the so-called transit method, when a, a star passes, sorry, when a planet passes in front of its host, host star, if the alignment is right, it blocks part of that star's light. We see a small dip in the brightness of the star, and we can infer a planet. And with other follow-up observations, we can arguably measure the mass and radius of the planet and infer if it's a rocky planet or a, a massive uh, Jupiter-type planet. The next phase is the search for so-called biosignatures of what is called biologically primitive life. This is the search for the spectral fingerprints of ongoing biology that would betray kind of out of equilibrium chemical conditions in the atmospheres of these planets in terms of the presence of oxygen, ozone, methane. And that's done, for, will be done, for example, with the recently launched James Webb Space Telescope and forthcoming ground-based, extremely large telescopes and um, dedicated space missions later this decade. It's technically immensely challenging work, but also scientifically, it's the interpretation of it is also challenging because we, we don't have kind of a general theory of life. There are other possible abiotic processes that may be able to, to mimic the presence of, of these, these signatures. The second front in the search for life is, is, is it focuses around SETI, the search for terrestrial extraterrestrial intelligence, which began in the 1960s looking for kind of communication signals with radio telescopes. That has since expanded into what's now known as the search for techno signatures more generally. So not just kind of communication signals, but the search for artifacts, probes, large scale engineering on stellar and galactic scales 
Another astronomical phenomena that completely defy a standard naturalistic explanation. And this whole area is poised for a radical, uh, radical uh, uh, d development with the onset of what's called time domain astronomy. So on the left, we see the large synoptic survey telescope, the, the Vera Rubin Observatory. So what this is going to be doing, the telescope in Chile is surveying the entire visible sky every few nights. So we will get repeated images of every part of the visible sky. So we'll be able to see things that are changing. So it's a very different type of astronomy from what we've been doing in the past, and just focusing very deeply on, on, on individual objects. So we're surveying the whole sky. And this is the Square Kilometre Array Observatory, for which I, I did some preparatory work, as Juliet mentioned earlier in my career. And that is also going to be at the forefront of, of searching for techno signatures. So this field, it began in the 60s and in a somewhat intermittent stop-start way. It was always a, a fringe topic, didn't, well, often lost, lost its funding, got cancelled. But then in 2015, it, it, there was a huge infusion of private philanthropic money through, through the Breakthrough Listen project, and it's really uh, spectacularly enhanced the, 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 the progress in, in this area in terms of surveying nearby stars and nearby galaxies. Nothing has been seen as yet. So these are the two main, main fronts uh, for the search for life on Earth. For completeness, I will also mention this, this field that you may be aware of, the, the search for UAPs, unidentified or unclassified atmospheric or aerial phenomena. It came to prominence again early this year. I remember seeing headlines on the 24-hour news. President Biden orders the US military to shoot down a UFO over Alaska and things like that. So there was a, all this kind of um, excitement over these unidentified flying objects with no known means of propulsion or navigation. And, but I'm not going to say much more about this at the moment because so far a lot of of the accounts, are the, the anecdotal accounts, there's a lot of conspiracy theories, allegations of cover-ups. Scientifically, I remain open to this, but it needs a systematic kind of scientific study. And that now seems to be underway with the so-called Galileo project led by the distinguished Harvard astronomer, Professor Abby Loeb. So it's going to be interesting to see what emerges in, in this space in the coming years. Still on the, on the case of, of controversies in the search for life, I want to mention this object, which is Oumuamua, Oumuamua, which in native Hawaiian means scout. So this is an object that was discovered by the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii back in 2017 during a search for just near-Earth objects and, and asteroids. And it caught the attention of astronomers for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was discovered to be on an unbound orbit. So unlike a near-Earth object that is on a, a circular or mildly elliptical orbit in the inner part of the solar system, or a comet on a highly eccentric but still closed elliptical orbit, this object was seen to be coming from interstellar space. So it was on an unbound orbit. It came into the solar system, came around the sun, we detected it, now it's on its way out of the solar system, never to return. And it was noticed that it exhibited very, very extreme brightness variations. So this is the light curve showing these variations in brightness over a number of hours. And arguably that's because the object is tumbling. And assuming that it was some kind of regular, kind of, oh, some kind of asteroid, they inferred that it must have a very elongated geometry, like a cigar potentially like a cigar-type geometry, as shown by this artist's impression here. Another anomaly was discovered, which was when it was on its way out of the solar system, its trajectory could not be explained purely in gravitational terms. Right? There was some additional source of acceleration. And now, for comets, that's not unusual to see. As a comet comes in, you get kind of jets of volatile gases and ices being produced that can, like rockets, can cause the object to accelerate. In this case, no such cometary coma or outgassing was seen. 
So it's unlike any known type of comet or asteroid that's ever been seen before. People have, astronomers have put forward kind of conventional naturalistic explanations. Maybe it's a, a solid hydrogen iceberg or other, other, other possibilities. But Avi Loeb, again, the distinguished Harvard astronomer, has actually proposed sensationally that this is not a naturally occurring object, but is actually an artificial piece of alien technology. Could be a, a fragment of a broken solar sail, or maybe a Dyson sphere that was once around, around a star that has just decayed over many billions of years and drifted into our solar system. And he's put forward this thesis in his book, Extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth. This has caused quite a sensation. <laughs> it's fair to say that the, the, the mainstream astronomical community look on it with considerable skepticism. But I, but I for one, am, I'm open to this, and he's become a, a, a considerable champion of, of this cause. And I think as we speak, he's, he's on a, an ocean voyage in the Pacific looking for the remnants of some, uh, some of the first interstellar meteors on the ocean floor of the Pacific, looking for, 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 to try and detect the fragments of these objects. So there are controversies in astronomy about, about the search for life. Right? And it, it's debatable whether, which is the more extreme. Is it more extreme to posit a completely new form of natural object that we've never seen before? Or is it more extreme to say, ah, it could be a piece of alien technology? So I'm now going to think more generally about wh where does life fit in the cosmic worldview. So astronomy is an observational science. We can't do experiments. We don't go to a lab and do experiments. We, we're limited by what we can observe, and we interpret those observations. But as I've said before, most, most of the major breakthroughs throughout the history of astronomy have been serendipitous. They've been the things we were not expecting. We were looking for something, and we saw something else. So the history of ast astronomy throughout the 20th century, and arguably before that, shows that. For example, the, the history of, of the discovery of pulsars, active galactic nuclei. And, and whenever we look at the universe in a new way, and until now, that's usually meant looking at a different wavelength of light. So instead of just looking with optical telescopes from the Earth, if we look with X-ray satellites, radio telescopes, we see a very different universe, right? And the frontiers that are opening up now are f f firstly in gravitational wave astronomy. The first detections were made confirming Einstein's theory for the existence of gravitational waves within the last decade. We're going to open up the new era of time domain astronomy, looking for things that are changing. So if we, if we look kind of more broadly at the history of astronomy, since the, the scientific revolution, right? We've kind of dispensed with the need for kind of any external agencies to be involved in, in running the cosmos, as it were, right? So it's all, it's, it's physics. And the kind of the pinnacle of that was the, the 20th century, which was the triumph of the astrophysical universe. And applying physics as we see it in the laboratory to understand stars, galaxies, and so on. That has, has brought up some new physics that we've not that we don't fully understand, like dark energy and dark matter, but notwithstanding that, it's been the triumph of the astrophysical universe. Within that, the search for life elsewhere has either not been really relevant, we've not had the means to do it, or it's been considered a, a fringe, slightly controversial topic. Now, however, we're in this intermediate zone of what I call the astrophysical and astrobiological universe. So the search for biologically primitive life is now mainstream astronomy, right? It's fully-fledged mainstream astronomy. But, as I said, we lack what's called the general theory of life. So the search for life is, is difficult. We don't really know what we're looking for. We're guided by how we understand life on Earth, but we don't know whether all life is like this or whether there are many, many different forms it could take. And within this, the search for, well, uh, techno signatures and SETI, they're increasingly accepted as as legitimate areas of modern astronomy, which is quite a shift from a few decades ago. And now, chiming in with this idea that when new discoveries are made, we, we find unexpected things. 
perhaps we might discover that intelligent life is ubiquitous, right? And but, but it could be abundant in the universe, right? Although it's evaded detection so far, perhaps as some proponents, some solutions of the Fermi paradox would posit, its capabilities are, well, are utterly beyond our comprehension, given the several billion year head start. Perhaps it's even able to shape and control astrophysical objects like stars and galaxies. Right? We interpret it as physics, but maybe there's more to it than meets the eye. Perhaps it's able to spread life through the universe. Obviously, this is a very <laughs> extreme, extreme viewpoint, very heretical. I'm not saying I, I think that, but we just don't know what course science will take, right? And if, if we do discover that intelligent agencies are at work in the cosmos, they would, in a way, bring us back full circle back to before the kind of the scientific revolution. So while we're on that theme, I just want to quickly uh, highlight the work of uh, the late Sir Fred, Fred Hoyle, who I've been reading about quite a lot during my time here in Capas. Sir Fred was one of the giants of 20th century astronomy, developed the rival to the Big Bang theory and the theory of stellar nuclear synthesis that explained the origin of pretty much all, all the elements in the universe. But he was, he was a, a maverick, controversial figure, right? He was at odds, frequently at loggerheads with the scientific establishment and, and, the, and the politics of science. And he resigned his Cambridge chair in the early 70s and went to live on a remote farm in the Lake District and was a, an independent scientist. He was also, he became a prolific science fiction writer and a proponent of the idea of panspermia, the idea that life did not originate in space, on Earth, but came to Earth from space. And in his first work of science fiction, The Black Cloud, what's found is that an interstellar dust cloud is found floating through space, but approaching the solar system. It eventually comes into the solar system, but rather mysteriously slows down as it approaches the sun, settles on the sun, blocks its light, that which leads to an apocalyptic cooling of the climate. And Sir Fred wrote several other apocalyptically themed science fiction novels that have been exploring. And puzzled by its uh, rather anomalous behavior, the scientists discover that the cloud actually is an intelligent life form. And towards the end of the novel, the scientists, they establish communication with the life form and manage to kind of uh, get themselves wired up to the, the signals from the cloud and ultimately several of the scientists die because their brains are overwhelmed by the sudden influx of very, very, very advanced knowledge. And Sir Fred wrote this novel, I think, well, reading really interviews with him from the 1990s, that around 1940, he proposed that clouds of molecular hydrogen gas are common in interstellar space. The scientific establishment said absolute rubbish, we, we don't, we, they, they really were against that idea. So, so Fred said the only way I could put this idea forward was by writing a, a science fiction novel. And of course, we know molecular hydrogen is abundant in interstellar space, as are many of the, the precursor molecules, organic molecules for life. So the novel can be read on, on many, many levels. So, so Fred kind of pushing forward his, his scientific ideas also showing that we haven't the faintest clue what form intelligent life or life in general may take in the universe. In this case, it was distributed superintelligence in a gigantic, highly dispersed molecular cloud with particles and ions guided by magnetic fields. He also used it to explore tensions between scientists and, and the government. Right, so just moving towards the end then, let's think about what's gonna happen several decades or maybe a century from now when we've had all these observational facilities working, what, will, what potentially will we have found? So it's the quest to determine will we see biosignatures or technosignatures or both or neither? What will we find? What will it mean? So the interesting thing is that we don't need a lot of detections, either of biosignatures or technosignatures, to be able to discern from the distribution, from the spatial clustering of these detections, whether life arose 
independently in, in multiple places, or whether it instead spread out, either naturally or by means of intelligent agency, from a smaller number of seed sites to the distribution of life we can see. And that was worked by Lingham and before that by Lynn, Lynn and Loeb, I think. But conversely, what if after a few decades we see nothing, right? So in some ways the situation is not going to be much changed from now. We've, we, 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 we've, we've not seen anything, but on the other hand, we've barely looked. What if we do not find any evidence, particularly for intelligent life? Or say, either that we discover nothing, or just kind of so-called primitive life, say just vegetation or some single-celled grey goo, right, that doesn't have any technology that can be detected. What, what could it mean? It could mean we're truly alone, or that civilizations destroy themselves at a certain stage of development, the great filter argument, or that becoming an interstellar civilization is so technologically demanding that none have achieved it. Or that some civilizations are so utterly and incomprehensibly more advanced than us that they use technology that we just cannot fathom. It's beyond our knowledge and detection capabilities and our apparent uniqueness could be illusory. But if we see nothing, I think this will lead to a, an enhanced vulnerability of our well, enhanced awareness of our vulnerability on the cosmics, the cosmic stage. And I'm showing again this image that we've seen in a couple of previous CAPAS lectures showing the Earth from space from Apollo 8 in the late 60s. And when astronauts see the Earth from outside, they have this so-called overview effect where it stimulates a dramatic change in their, in, their, in their psyche. And arguably, these images kind of spawned the environmental movement in, in the 70s. So wrapping up now, as we think about our own long-term future, in space. So it's, it's certain that the Earth will become uninhabitable in about a billion years' time, right? As the sun evolves and brightens and expands, right? That's, that's certain. It's likely, from what I've, I've said, that other more random existential cosmic hazards will likely affect Earth before then and pose an existential risk. And clearly, I do not need to to mention that there are many, many homegrown threats that pose significantly more immediate risks in the current, the current century. But the fact remains that if, if any form of life is ultimately to survive all of these threats, we must eventually, in the course of time, diversify the domain of life beyond the Earth, ultimately beyond the solar system. And I argue that the search for life beyond the Earth is complementary to that. It gives us a new perspective on our place in the universe, new motivation to explore, and perhaps even if there's a, a benign encounter with an advanced civilization, perhaps we may get some useful technological insights. So uh, let's focus now on the immediate, immediate next steps. So this decade, humanity is due to return to the moon after a, a gap of many, many decades with the Artemis program and the, the Lunar Gateway uh, space station. And this was the first mission of the program, uncrewed mission approaching the moon December last year. But this is not just aimed to be like a, a short-lived flags and footprints program as the Apollo missions were in the 60s and 70s, but the aim is to establish a long-term presence with commercial and international partners for kind of scientific, technological benefits, economic benefits, and ultimately to move on to Mars. And if we had time, I could talk about the next steps beyond, beyond that even, but I, I don't have time for that. So in the final slide, what I want to mention is that there's another aspect that features prominently in NASA's plans for rationale for, for going back to the moon, and that is inspiration. Inspiration for the next generation of explorers. I end with these two images. This is an image from nine, December 1972 of the last humans on the moon. This is a quote from President John F. Kennedy about 10 years before that. Very powerful quote, effectively launching launching the program. And as someone who 
grew up in the aftermath of the, the Apollo program, in the shadows of Apollo, I personally derived immense inspiration from reading the accounts and seeing the images of the Apollo program so I can personally attest to the, the galvanizing and motivating effect that such, such images uh, do have. So with that, I will draw to a close and thank you very much for your attention and I invite any questions you may have. <laughs>